ways of uh, electing our chairs. Yesterday, we approved 18 chairs, and it uh, was pretty exciting for us. Uh, we had three contested races, and among, uh, that included Congresswoman Rosa DeLorme, now chair of the Appropriations Committee, following in the footsteps of the first woman uh, to serve in that capacity, Nita Lowy, paving the way. Uh, all three candidates were women for chair of appropriations. The chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Greg Meeks of New York. He, it, uh, say Rosa, is of Connecticut. Greg Meeks of, of New York, following the steps of another New Yorker, uh, Elliot Engel, and uh, the chair of the Ag Committee, uh, uh, David Scott from Georgia, uh, the first African American ever chosen to be the chair of the Agriculture Committee. Pretty exciting, following in the footsteps, the great leadership of Colin Peterson. Greg Meeks, also African American, so it was pretty historic, a woman and two African Americans in the contested races. But throughout our, our leadership, half the leadership are either women or people of color in the uh, chairs of the committee. There are more chairs to be announced, but these were the ones that related to um, uh, rules and budget related to the steering and policy committee. So those were two of the speaker's announcements that I made. There are others that will follow. But as I said to the members then, the gavels, we held the house, we'll hold the gavels, 132 of them, starting with the 18 that were chosen yesterday. But I'm excited about it because when they made their presentations over the f several days this week, it was a demonstration of values, of knowledge, of commitment to America's working families in every one of our committees and the beautiful diversity of those committees as well. So it was a cause uh, for celebration. As you know, we are in the, uh, let me do this right. We are, oh wow, it hurts, but it will may stay up. <laughs> we are in the lame duck session. Uh, we have important work to do here. Uh, uh, we spent a good deal, first part of lame duck, on the national defense of, uh, authorization legislation. I want to salute uh, our chairman, Adam, S Adam Smith, and Mr. Thornberry, the ranking member, for the great bipartisan legislation they put together. It's, uh, this is the national security, the oath we take to protect and defend our Constitution, our country. And I'm very, very proud of the work that went into it and now uh, will come to the floor uh, next week. Uh, our leader, Mr. Hoyer, will be talking about scheduling there. But I want to uh, reference some of what Adam Smith and uh, Mac Thornberry said about the bill and, and their statement on the conference report. Among the provisions we are most proud of, and I, we join them in this, the authorization of hazardous duty pay for our servicemen and women in, and members in harm's way, improvements to military housing and programs for military families and children with special needs, Quality of life for our military families is very essential to our national security. Addressing the shortest of military child care, authorizing $8.4 billion in military construction projects to fortify critical infrastructure and base realignment and closure cleanup, very essential. Important new tools to deter China and Russia. Reforms to make the Pentagon more efficient, innovative, and cost-effective. Significant bipartisan provisions on artificial intelligence and cybersecurity, and provisions that strengthen our alliance with Israel. I uh, especially want to acknowledge how pleased we are uh, with the leadership also of Congressman Anthony Brown, a member of the committee, a veteran of our services, uh, a, a decorated member of the military who now serves in the House, Anthony Brown. Uh, we provided long-term uh, we included the process of changing the names of military bases purposefully, purposefully named for white supremacists. How could that have been? They just decided to name the bases for white supremacists. I'm so happy personally because I have four brothers who served in the Army, and they served on many of those bases around the country, and we would always just say, why, why is that? Now it isn't. Um, but it also provides long overdue benefits to veterinary 
veteran area veterans uh, who were impacted by Agent Orange. This was really important to many of us. This issue was long overdue when we passed it. Now it needed to be improved, and they do so in the bill. And again, the, on the bait, get back to the basis, it reflects our highest ideals as Americans. We urge the president to sign the NDA, which has been passed on a bipartisan basis for 59 years. This will be 60. So again, this, was, this is very, um, shall we say, intensive in terms of the attention it requires. Our members uh, were constantly working on it, and that's why I wanted to take the time to take the pride in this legislation. As you know, we are engaged in the talks on the omnibus bill. When I spoke to Sec uh, Leader McConnell yesterday, we talked about the possibility of putting a COVID package on the omnibus bill. But he and I, being appropriators, know uh, that if you're going to do that, you have to have an omnibus bill. And so we have to work through the um, all of the uh, uh, provisions that are still unresolved there, we're making progress. Congress, uh, Madam Chair Nita Lowy and Chair Shel Richard Shelby on the Senate side have come to, to great agreement on the 302Bs. That's more, more um, appropriations talk, but, and, and how they would proceed. Uh, they've made great progress. More needs to be done. And at the same time, simultaneous with that, we're working on the COVID package. And on Wednesday was our deadliest day. Every day that anyone dies is a complete tragedy for our country. 2,800 Americans lost. We believe that one of the saddest parts of it is the neglect that this administration has paid. Delay, denial, distortion, hoax, and now, finally, we have a new dynamic, a new president in a um, little more than a month committed to crushing the virus, a new dynamic, a vaccine, a successful vaccine, more than one successful vaccine, to make all the difference in the world that is imminent till the inauguration and the emergence of the vaccine, which will be soon, but not for everyone, just because of the, the uh, quantity needed and the money needed to, to go from vaccine, from the lab, to vaccination, to the arm. And that is going to require more than we're talking about now, but what Joe Biden has been talking about. We believe, uh, uh, um, Schumer, Leader Schumer and I believe that the framework, the bipartisan framework unveiled by the senators in a bipartisan way, with the support of House members, Josh Gottheimer in the House from our side, um, on both sides of the aisle, could be a basis for real bicameral negotiations. We, it's not text yet, it's a framework, so as they work on the text, we hope it'll take us very close to something we can put into the, into the uh, omnibus, which is at the same time being worked. Um, uh, President-elect Biden has said that this package would be just, at best, just a start. And that's how we see it as well. It's less money, but over a shorter period of time, and it, we need to do it to save lives and livelihood with the hope that much more help is on the way. The, uh, again, we will, this vaccine has had such high, 95% uh, was the, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine give us great hope. But again, we have to have the resources to, to exercise our options that we have to buy the vaccine. I would hope that the president would immediately exercise the uh, call upon the Defense Production Act to produce the vaccine. That's what it is going to require to have the amount that we need. And then to have the logistics, the money there for the states uh, to, and that further highlights the need for funding for state and local government. Because we can pay for the vaccine, we can pay for its delivery, 
but it's administration of it by healthcare professionals and others still needs to be funded as well. So that's good news from, uh, but uh, help is on the way from Joe Biden who sees the need. We had uh, some not so good news on the job front that further necessitates our taking action to crush the virus, to open up the economy, to open up our schools. But in order to do so, we must do so safely, science-based science in our approach on all of it. You probably did see the uh, jobs report this morning, which is indicative, is indicative of uh, further indicative of the need for us to have crushed the virus so the economy can get going. So all of that is to come to this place to say there is momentum. There is momentum uh, with the action that the senators and House members in a bipartisan way have taken with them. It could provide meaning relief for millions who are suffering economically, personally, health-wise. And so I'm pleased that uh, the tone of our conversations is one that uh, is indicative of uh, the, the decision to get the job done. That, I'll take any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I heard what you said about momentum. Realistically, how soon do you and Leader McConnell need to cut a deal in order to have a package to vote on before the holidays? Well, we will have, we have the time to do it. It doesn't, it, it, it the, and again, we want to have it on the omnibus. We have to have an omnibus, and we're hoping that that will accelerate the discussions on the omnibus. We are going to keep government open. You know, we're not going to have a continuing resolution, but we need to take the time to do that. And then, as, as I said, we saw a framework. They're putting, uh, now they have to turn it into text. And then, uh, so we'll take the time we need and we must get it done, and we must get it done by uh, this before we leave. We cannot leave without it. Hmm? But does that mean you have about a week to negotiate? No, it, 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 it doesn't matter. We will take the time that we need, and the question is, um, uh, when will the text be ready so that we can combine it into the... Uh, but the, the uh, uh, omnibus is not finished yet. We have a number of what we call ash and trash it's a lot of other issues that need to be resolved, and they're in the course of doing that. And I don't want to in any way undermine the great bipartisan negotiations that are going on between the uh, Democrats and Republicans, Senator Shelby as, as the chair of the Appropriations Committee in the Senate, Nita Lowy as the chair in the House, their staffs working together. So don't worry about a date. It will be in sufficient time for us to, to get it done. The sooner the better, but not at the expense of the initiatives that we need to address in the bills. Thank you. So uh, just to be clear, you said no continuing resolution. I don't want any help. Right, I understand that. But if, if you are on the precipice of getting a coronavirus D, and you can't, if you oh, are on the precipice. We'll be really long before that. Oh, oh, okay. But, yeah. but what shifted, in your opinion, when the Problem Solvers Caucus had a much larger bill a few months ago, you did not like that piece of yeah. legislation? What, 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 what has shifted now when they're on board with this piece that's come out of the Senate? Perhaps you missed what I said earlier. Joe Biden committed to ending and crushing the virus and having a Build a Better America uh, initiative, Big Back Better, a vaccine answer to our prayers, an answer to our prayers of 95% effectiveness in terms of Pfizer and Moderna, and there may be others uh, coming forward. Uh, that makes, uh, that is a total game changer, a new president and a vaccine. So th there's nothing to, co th these are different, what, what was then before was not more of this. This is, has simplicity. It's what we've had in our bills. It's for a shorter period of time, but that's okay now because we have a new president, a president who recognizes that we need to depend on science 
to stop the virus, a president who understands that America's working families need to have money in their pockets in a way that takes them into the future without any of the contraptions of any of the other bills uh, that the administration was associating itself with in the board. We feel very excited about the prospect that the there's a bipartisan bill, because I told members I'm not bringing any more bills that are not bipartisan. We wanted to, to, to um, show what needs to be done in the interest of negotiation. They're negotiating. It's a good product. It's not everything we want. Don't get me wrong. I, I don't want the Republicans to think that, we, uh, that this is a dream come true. It is not. But it is a path forward. Yeah. Well, not to accept half of a loaf months ago. And you said, I'm not going to accept half a loaf. Look, I'm going to tell you something. Now, don't don't characterize what we did before as a mistake, as a preface to your question, if you want an answer. That was not a mistake. It was a decision, and it has taken us to a place where we can do the right thing without other, shall we say, considerations in the legislation that we don't want. Now, that is it. Now, th the fact is, I'm very proud of where we are. My chairs, my chairs have worked very hard on all of this. They were not even happy with a, a proposal that we made the other day before we saw this proposal. They thought we had come back too, too small. So it's not about an individual, it's about how we address the needs of the American people. And we have to do it in a scientific way, and we have to do it in a way that recognizes people need food on the table. They need to get their rent paid. They need money in their pockets. They need their unemployment insurance to be there. They do not need a whole cacophony of other things that are on the agenda that have nothing to do with meeting their needs. So we're very pleased at where it is. And as I say, with a Democratic president committed to a scientific solution for this, with the idea that we will have a vaccine it's a complete game changer from them. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Yes, Speaker. The, 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 the petition that... No, um, I'm just you, recognizing you. Oh, thank you. Joe Biden says that on his first day in office, he will use Title IX to give transgender students access to sports, bathrooms, and locker rooms in accordance with their gender identity in all federally funded schools. Does he have the power to unilaterally do this, and do you agree with this? Yes, and I think he does. Yes, ma'am. Speaker Pelosi, the uh, petition that Rita Hart um, is, is uh, going to file soon as far as her race is concerned over in Iowa, how is, uh, how is the House going to prevent a, a situation that was seen in 1985 between McCloskey um, and, and, uh, and his Republican opponent? And would you encourage uh, the, the, uh, the loser of the New York 22 race to do the same thing if their recount ends in a very you know, slim well, margin? Uh, the the issue in relating to Iowa is an issue for the House Administration Committee. It is my understanding uh, that the, uh, Rita Hart, an excellent candidate for Congress, has, uh, will be asking the House to take this up. But that, for further information about the technicalities of that, that becomes it's a House, not a political, but a House administration matter. House decides who it will seat. We don't have any idea. The, New York is a completely different situation. New York is a completely dis different situation. New York, the, there could be 1,500, 5,000 votes not counted yet. So that is going into the courts. I think Monday is the day in the court. And that is, uh, and that is what is, um, uh, we'll see what happens in the court, and that may end up in the Congress. I don't know but the court will decide which votes will be counted. But that's like down to 12 votes. It's interesting. People should know, everyone should know his or her vote counts. Six votes are what the spread is at the moment in uh, Iowa. 12 votes. Now, this is on the basis of hundreds of thousands of votes cast, of hundreds of thousands of votes cast. So it is, um, it is one of those uh, matters that... Time will tell. We'll see what the court says. We'll see what the uh, House administration uh, options are and what they decide to do as they go forward. 
I just want to get a clarification as it relates to your conversations with, with uh, Leader McConnell. Yes. So is this now a situation where we're expecting a, an omnibus and any sort of coronavirus relief to be meshed into one piece of legislation? That would be, our, be our hope. Vote? That would be our hope because that is the vehicle leading, leaving the station. And that's probably, uh, I was pleased that he wanted to, to do it that way because that's how we have I thought would that's what we thought would be the best way to do. The vehicles leaving the station, all in other words, you see a bill come to the floor, you don't see the whole underpinnings and the orchestration of what it takes to get to a place. So if there's a vehicle and we can add uh, this language once we see the text, uh, that is what we would be doing. Would you need, a, would you need a, an agreement on both components to bring something to the floor? Oh yeah, yeah, yes, and that's what we're that's what we're working on. Yes, and, and because we would want a big strong vote, as we will have, getting back to where I earlier, on the national uh, defense bill. We are very proud of the bipartisanship that has gone into that, uh, the uh, quality of life issues there for uh, uh, military families, also the uh, a system to change the names of the bases that were named for white supremacists. In some cases, by design, named for former members of the Confederacy, well after the Civil War. So again, there are many things in there that, about our practical uh, uh, responsibility to protect and defend, but also about our values. For us, that was not an, a provision or an issue. It was an ethic. It was a, uh, it was a, a, a value. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.